Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to our conference on social innovation in the energy transition. Um, it is the second day and I uh, hope uh, that you all had a good night's sleep um, and uh, did some reminiscing about all the se sessions that you saw and the presentations from our keynote speakers. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time and were not here yesterday, um, but in, in, are in, his, in this session, um, let me briefly explain a little bit more about our um, platform, because you know that this uh, a conference on social innovation in the energy transition, but actually there is a platform called Social Innovation in the Energy Transition. And this platform uh, was established by myself and uh, my colleague, Thomas Hoppe. And we are both working at the Faculty of Technology, Policy and Management uh, at Delft University uh, of Technology in the Netherlands. So I'm actually here in this faculty now at this moment. And, uh, and on the social wall, maybe you've already seen it, um, there's also a picture from our uh, nerve center, as we call it here, where you can see all our student assistants and all the other people who are moderating the sessions and also some of our chairs. So um, we are here at our uh, faculty and we um, started this platform on social innovation and the energy transition approximately four years ago. And we also organized the conference then. And the conference then was here in Delft. And it was also a two-day conference and we already uh, attracted a, a large public. Also, uh, not only people from um, uh, academia, but also practitioners. And uh, we see that there's a lot of um, need for the kind of research that we are doing on social innovation in the energy transition. And um, actually what we see, and I will, uh, uh, Thomas also um, uh, discussed it with us and told it yesterday in the, in the opening session, the, the concept of social innovation as we uh, use it is very broad. So we talk about um, things ranging from co-creation to uh, nudging to uh, other new things that we are doing besides technology. Because the reason um, for us to start at this platform on social innovation in the energy transition was to show that we are doing more in Delft than um, technological innovation. Um, we are working here with approximately 900 uh, scientists on uh, at the energy in the energy domain, which is a lot, of course, and it's uh, varying with, between PhDs and, uh, till uh, full professors. Um, but a, a part of that is working on social science, and uh, that is not known by everybody. And uh, actually, we also collaborate a lot um, with the, the engineers, the modelers, the designers, uh, and with the social scientists in a lot of multidisciplinary um, uh, research projects. Some of them are also uh, um, presented in some of the sessions yesterday and today. Um, today, we have a full program. Um, I'm taking a short look. We are going to start um, in a couple of minutes with the keynote presentation from Julia Wittmeyer. We're looking very much forward to that. Uh, we had a, a webinar, um, I think last year from Julia um, in one of our uh, web webinars on this, in a series that we do as a platform. Um, so we're looking forward to watch that. Then at 10.30, we have six, uh, no, uh, four workshops and two uh, panel sessions. Then we have a lunch break uh, from 12 till 12.45. Then there's another uh, panel session uh, series. There are six panel sessions, then a coffee break, and then again, six panel sessions. And then we will have a plen plenary closing sessions. Um, I also want to um, stress out that it's important that if you are a speaker or a chair, please use the uh, Eureka platform. So it's the dashboard and you got a separate link for that. Um, and you need to use that because only through the dashboard you can be a speaker and you can upload your presentation. So if you are in the attendee uh, mode, so the, 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 the home web page through the web app of the of Conference Compass, where the project or the conference is running on, then you don't have the right to, to present. So make sure that if you need to present or you are a chair, use the Eureka dashboard. And I also want to point out that we have a social wall so uh, in the web app version of the, of the conference, there's a social wall. You can find pictures, you can find invitation. Uh, please like the, the social um, 
things that you that you like. <laughs> and uh, also, if you are in a session and you want to ask questions, use the Q&A and you can uh, actually also vote there. So you can upvote questions that you like. Um, I'm wondering if Thomas, I see that Thomas is, uh, I think, also here. Maybe he oh, also yeah. wants to join us. Um, and I see that Julia is also here, Julia. Hello. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Gedeen. Hi, Julia. Hi. Um, Thomas, can I give you the floor to introduce Julia? Because I think I've said all the things that need to be said. Maybe you have something to uh, to add to it. But I try to tell all the, the practicalities. Um, if not, now then uh, people can maybe look in the chat. Maybe one of the moderators can put information there that I forgot to say, which is important. But then I will mute myself now and give the floor to Thomas. Uh, thank you, Gerina. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, uh, I would like to say that we're very delighted to have uh, Dr. Julia Wittmeyer here, who is assistant professor at uh, DRIFT, a research institute about uh, transformative change at Erasmus University in uh, Rotterdam. And Julia has been working on social innovation in sustainable transitions uh, for uh, yeah, a large number of years. Uh, well, you and I will inform, uh, or, yeah, will inform us how long this has been, but as long as, as I know, it, it, it goes back to uh, at least uh, 2013. Uh, Julia has also been involved in the Transit Project, which is a project on transformative social innovation, which was a, a big European funded project and uh, derived at the developing a middle range theory about how social innovation induced uh, institutional and transformative change, for instance, in energy transition. I think based on this theory and concept, multiple European projects uh, were started, including PROSA and SONNET, in which the concept of social innovation in the energy transitions was further elaborated. And of course, I'm very glad, we are very glad that Julie will inform us about her research agenda and how this is uh, continued and how the concept of social innovation in the energy transition is uh, elaborated in that regard. So I, I would like to give the floor to Julia and please go ahead and enlighten us about your research. Uh, many thanks in it. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, and let me share my screen. So everything should be visible. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, always enjoy our interaction and also glad to be able to share our research that uh, that yeah goes back to when we started the transit project um, in 2013. Back then it wasn't about energy systems so much, it was about social innovation more broadly. Um, and the last years it's really focusing, taking that knowledge and taking it to the energy system. So that's also where this, uh, where my uh, title for the talk today comes from, Social Innovation and Energy, Transforming Energy Systems, question mark. And this is a rather big question, so it can be answered in many different ways. And in what follows, um, I will go in more detail into three aspects. I thought to share those with you. The first one is social innovations in energy, what these are and how we can systematically look at them. The second aspect is energy transitions as transformative changes in, in structures, cultures, and practices of our societies and how these relate to social innovation. And finally, focusing in on actors and role relations as a specific element of how uh, energy systems are being configured and possibly changed. Um, in zooming in on these three points, I fall back on past research that uh, Thomas has just already introduced. Uh, mainly the, the from the transit project, transformative social innovation theory project, and current research in the context of the SONNET project that focuses on the diversity, the processes, but also the contributions that social innovations make to um, the energy transition. So what you seem to see when you start looking around, what scholars mean uh, when they refer to social innovation in energy, uh, it has been linked to a lot of broad range of phenomena, including community energy, uh, energy games, green nudges. If you look at the program of this conference, you see all these different kind of types coming up there. And um, the concept is taken up as, as this short uh, scope search shows. Uh, but what is also apparent that there's only a handful of slides that actually defines or conceptualizes it. 
uh, but there's more work being done uh, on that currently. And in Solid, we build then on this transformative social innovation theory to define social innovations in energy as the combinations of ideas, actions, and or objects that change social relations and that evolve new ways of doing, thinking, and or organizing energy. So we have this definition, which is basically threefold, uh, defining the social material configurations that change relations and that involve um, new activities. And if we take the example of the cooperative renewable energy production, or often referred to as community energy, um, just to give it to illustrate this definition, uh, it combines ideas about how energy can be produced locally, renewables, uh, with objects that make this possible, such as windmills or PV panels, uh, and necessary actions, such as putting the panels on roofs or applying for a subsidy. So, these combinations of ideas, actions, and objects has then the potential to change social relations between, for example, the neighbors involved on a very uh, small scale, but also between citizens and their local and national governments uh, and uh, on how um, energy production and consumption is being um, regulated and uh, afforded, um, as well as between incumbent industry actors and cooperatives as new market entrants, so the, the, the market relations. It involves new ways of, of doing, uh, you know, producing energy on your own rooftop, investing in local uh, wind turbines, for example, with these new ways of thinking and decentralized and decarbonization, uh, decarbonized energy production and, and the reinvention of the cooperative model as one example of new ways of organizing. A second example is gaming and not, uh, or gaming. Um, you have also talked about that during uh, the conference. And there's many different forms that gaming can take, but one example is a competition between user groups that are facilitated by, by digital technologies or a competition between cities or city level competitions. And these change the relation between members of, for example, the user group, but also within city administrations, because it means that um, different departments have to work together to prepare uh, for such competitions and to, to uh, implement the necessary measures. Um, and so it, it involves these new ways of thinking about and, and doing and regulating energy consumptions also, for example, including new uh, digital tools. And based on this perspective, uh, we have argued in a recent paper with a, a number of colleagues, including Khadim and, um, and Thomas, that uh, the mainstream understanding of social innovation is often surrounded with kind of a narrowness in its scope and also in its purpose. So the idea that if we if we, we keep it too small, our understanding uh, and do not open it up broad enough, uh, we will miss out on some of the potential that the concept has. So we highlight four ways to broaden that framing, um, and that tries to marry the more critical scholarship, so in, in a critical tradition, tradition, with a, a more um, applied scholarship that looks forward. How can we use social innovation? Because we think, yeah, we also need to to think about social innovation as as, a, as an instrument. To a certain degree to help us um, uh, um, bring forward the, the energy transition. So these four ways are uh, social innovation as, uh, as being multi-directional and it was normative complexity. So there's not there's not one social innovation, there's not one desirable way, but there's many very different um, normativities that are in, in used or that are expressed through social innovations. Um, it can originate uh, in and also involves multiple societal spheres. So it's not only about those community cooperatives, it's not only about the social entrepreneurs and the digital tools, it's also about how multiple actors get involved and make it possible. Um, it's uh, about social material intertwinement. So while we push social innovation to as, as a counterpart to, to, to the, the current focus on more technological innovations, it is very much a combination of the social and the material that we, of course, need to look at. Um, and then um, it's not only about implementing the so social innovation, also as being something that comes with an experimental approach. A fifth dimension that's important to understand uh, when we say new ways of doing thinking and organizing as part of our de definition is that um, new does not necessarily relate to um, something that's completely new. It's, it's specifically new in a certain context, it's new combination of existing things, it's reinventions or reassertion of practices that differ from, from the mainstream in that certain context. So building on that understanding of social innovation 
in energy, the question arises then how can we make further sense of this empirically? So what are then different types of social innovations that can be identified? And um, to allow for a more systematic identification and analysis of this diversity, um, we developed a typology. Um, and we started off with singling out two conceptual variables that come from this definition that we're using. The first one is that we take uh, social relations to be um, a variable that can be operationalized to different types of social interactions. And secondly, that we think about the new ways of doing thinking and organizing to refer to different ways in which social innovations manifest in the energy system. So we take these two variables um, and put them in a matrix, um, taking cooperation, exchange, competition, and conflict as these different types of social interactions um, and uh, the, different, the three different ways of manifestation. And then we embarked on what we what was a kind of explorative and iterative process um, of operationalizing and mapping different social innovation initiatives across um, eight European countries. In total, we mapped uh, about 500 initiatives, um, and this was all done following an iterative process of considering the country context and our broad definition, what could count as an initiative that works on a, on a social innovation. This is a very full slide. You're going to see it uh, coming back uh, more often. But the, um, the analysis, that's basically the, the results uh, of our analysis in the 18 different types of social relations in energy that we have been um, distinguishing. And um, I would like to just give some examples, but to start with, make it a bit more uh, alive. Uh, the first example is um, of collaborative eco-efficient housing. And that's, for example, if you think about eco-villages or eco-communities. Um, that work together or sit, uh, work and live together in certain either ha bigger houses or, or really neighborhoods. Um, you can think of peer-to-peer -peer learning in terms of, uh, in, in the Netherlands, there's the energy party, which basically is um, a get-together of peers that talk with each other about uh, energy reduction, but also uh, energy, the reduction of energy consumption, but also the energy bills. Um, the campaigns against specific energy pathways, since that's about thinking, it's really much new frames being used to, um, to discredit certain energy pathways that can be against gas, but it can also be against wind, so that, that's open. Um, investment and finance mechanisms, that's where you need to think about, for example, crowdfunding, but also about certain types of um, uh, subsidies um, that allow then uh, changes in social relations. And the final example is of participatory energy dialogues um, as, an, as a kind of an organizing uh, type of social innovation. That is when um, the Le Grand Debat in, in, in Nantes, in a, a city in France, uh, organized, had organized a, a, a big debate with their uh, citizens um, to think about how they could decarbonize uh, the city further. So it's about involving uh, multiple stakeholders in thinking about how to advance um, decarbonization in that um, specific example. Um, and looking at this um, typology, I would like to highlight uh, six different points with you. Um, the first is that it is an overview of social innovations in energy, not of social innovation initiatives. So that means um, when you think about, for example, a renewable energy cooperative as an initiative, as an actor, it is not only involved and boxed within the cooperative energy production and consumption on, on the type of social innovation in the upper left, but it's also about uh, often such cooperatives are also organizing peer-to-peer -peer learning activities. They take part in participatory energy dialogues in their cities as, as a participant. So that shows that that actors can be working and are usually working at different uh, types of these social innovations. Um, it also allows to see that each of these social innovations draws, is a, are multi-actor endeavors, basically. They are driven by certain actors, but also enabled and impeded by others. So we're looking at it much more in, in context. Um, what this um, typology also allows us to see is that um, it goes beyond what is currently considered or often considered as, as what is social innovation 
uh, in energy in literature. So specifically, when you look at um, at, uh, at at those using the term explicitly uh, in their in their work, and that's often then focused on the more cooperation part, the more collaborative um, aspects of of, of phenomena, phenomena, but also um, the kind of bottom-up uh, uh, approaches. And this typology goes beyond that in that it, for example, also includes the, the conflict part. So um, taking as examples of social innovation, those combinations of ideas, actions, and objects that exhibit conflict as, as, a, as a type of social interaction and also contribute to deinstitutionalization and the contestation of what actually is desirable in a certain context. It also takes, uh, and that's the, the, the thinking uh, manifestation part, it also takes ideas as important aspects of innovation. So uh, technological innovation is kind of considered innovation rather than, than, than just an idea or just an, an uh, uh, invention once it's right for the market. Uh, that's different for social innovation. Socially no ideas can be socially innovative in that they uh, are considered as kind of social facts and are considered to be true and therefore guide behavior. So that's a much bigger um, aspect of that for social, uh, to take into account to think about social innovation. Um, the fifth point is that um, the role of technology, so in some of these types of social innovation, um, it plays a prominent role, such for example, in the local peer-to-peer -peer electricity exchange, while um, it's less so, for example, for these campaigns against specific energy pathways. So there's different uh, roles that technology plays in these different types. And then uh, finally, the, the extent to which social innovations are innovative depends really on the actual context. So while energy cooperatives are less innovative in a Swiss context, for example, they're very much so in, in, a, in a French uh, context. And what we did in the context of the SONNET project is that we studied um, six of these social innovation fields um, in three countries each. So we have 18 case studies where we look at how these um, social innovations uh, and their fields, I will come back to that, emerged, developed, and institutionalized over time for the last, about the last 10 years we focused on. So how then does innovation, social innovation relate to transformative change? Um, when looking at social innovation, such as the gaming or the community energy, and asking under which conditions uh, it can be transformative. Our answer is that social innovation and thus community energy can be transformative to the extent that it challenges, alters, and or replaces the dominant structures and institutions in the socio-material context. So that means when you, when you have the gaming, when you have the community energy, it is that they need to challenge, alter, or replace, or the extent to which they do so, uh, that is what they consider their transformative potential. And in doing so, they often play into um, existing macro developments, what is in the transition theory often uh, referred to as landscape, such as climate change, but also such something like a global economic crisis. So when you come back to the different types of social innovations in energy, this also means that innovation is not the same as transformative change in, in how we conceptualize it. Uh, transformative change is about this challenging, altering and replacing the dominant institutions and these dominant institutions are not the new, but the dominant ways of doing thinking and organizing. So those structures, cultures, and practice that we consider normal or, or given in a, in a certain system. Um, innovations are not only about, uh, or there's elements of these social innovations that are not only about you know, making something new, but there's also certain elements that just reproduce dominant institutions. So there will be, for example, um, the gaming, for example, has this element of competition within it, which is a market-based kind of ideology. Um, and that is just being reproduced there, um, just as, as an example, while it, of course, changes other parts. And the last aspect is that we look at, at in, as, a, as social innovation and uh, the, the transformative aspect of as a, as a kind of process or degree. So it's not an either or, but it's transformative to the extent that it actually um, um, challenges, alters, and replaces the dominant institutions. And to analyze this kind of dialectic relation of social innovation with transformative change, so this relation, this with dialectic, I mean that it both reproduces as well as kind of transforms or has the potential to transform 
institutions. It's not enough to only analyze and understand the development of specific social innovation initiatives. That's an entry point. Um, and it's often done. But we argue that the focus should be on understanding how social innovations evolve as, as in, um, in what we call a field approach. So drawing on uh, Flickstein and McAdam and their strategic action fields, we think that a field approach can be employed um, to look at the opportunity, uh, to look at uh, not these initiatives and not at the, the, the big transformative change, but at the mesa level social orders that exist. Because these orders are basically um, means that actors are taking each other into account. We take uh, into account the actions of others and through this kind of produce and also reproduce specific ways of doing thinking and organizing at what we consider as being normal or legitimate. And this is also so already referring to the kind of institutional work that that, act, that actors are doing. Um, yeah, and our social innovation perspective does really zoom in on this social fabric, on actor configurations in social innovation fields, the roles and relations of these actors. And depending on the degree, the degree to which actors' roles and relations are normalized, so they become part of these dominant institutions, um, but also the extent to which these are challenged, altered, or replaced shows the transformative potential of social innovations in energy. And that's what I uh, want to um, get in uh, in the last section of my talk. Um, but first, I need to, to get a step back before I go back to the empirics. Uh, is basically how to study this, how to study these actors' roles and relations and how these are changing and the extent to which these are or can be transformative. So with my colleague Flora Vendina, we have developed the heuristic, um, the multi-actor perspective to analyze actors, their roles um, and relations in transitions. And this multi-actor perspective um, is based on a distinction between uh, public and private, between for-profit and non-profit, and between formal and informal. And this results then in a distinction between the state as being formal, non-profit and public, the market as being private, for-profit, and formal, the community as being private, informal, and non-profit, and, and the non-profit sector uh, as uh, private, for-profit, and formal. Uh, and then we included the hybrid sphere as an intermediary actor uh, sector, because what this really shows is that these boundaries are permeable, and they are also uh, being they are also shifting, so they're not fixed in that sense. And these different sectors can be seen in different ways. So they can be seen in terms of institutional logics. So the state logic, the market logic, the community logic, and how these govern, for example, how such logics govern certain systems or the extent to which they do. Um, but they can also be looked at in terms of the different uh, roles that are enacted within each of these institutional logics. So both at, by organizations, but also by individuals. So you can think of a state logic um, roles as being politicians, citizens, uh, policymakers within the market, it's producers, entrepreneurs. So that means that within different logics, we as individuals assume different roles and also make those roles, but organizations also do. So in this present state, this looks rather neat and ordered uh, and all kind of equal. Um, while in reality, some institutional logics are really more dominant than others. Um, and if you think of the energy system, and being aware of the limitations of generalizations, um, we might argue that in modern Western societies, uh, energy systems, uh, it looks much more like this, with the dominance of the state and the market logic. Um, and if you take the energy system, so as an example, it has been kind of bureaucratized and marketized. A lot has been delegated to the welfare state, the whole energy provision and security regulations around that, but also to the market and public-private partnerships. And the more informal uh, community and also the non-profit sector have been kind of cornered, if you like, and marginalized, to put it a bit black and white. Um, and this also means that in terms of the social interactions, um, the types of social interactions that we have been looking at, that it's much more the exchange type, so the kind of trade, I give you something, you give me something in return, which can be uh, both um, uh, physical things, but also uh, immaterial things. Um, and and more the competition uh, type in terms of okay, competing for a, a scarce resource 
that then um, but following specific rules. So how is this all shifting or not through social innovations in energy? I would like to go into um, two examples. Um, one is the framings against fossil fuel-based energy pathways. Um, and this is a social innovation basically that consists of, the, of, of novel ideas against such fossil fuel energy pathways. And these can be divestment, so framing investments in, in fossil fuels as both morally as well as financially untenable or questionable, but also fossil fuels, framing fossil fuels as not being necessary anymore to secure energy supply. And they combine such ideas with actions such as protesting, campaigning, lobbying, using both established means like bodies, banners, the sites, the actual sites of extraction but also more novel digital um, infrastructures like websites, social media, um, for example. And these pot potentially change social relations between society at large, if you like, and the fossil fuel industry. That's really the, the relation that they focus on. And um, uh, the social innovation actors, they aim to change the, the dominant societal discourse. So they really engage in different framings, uh, influence policymakers and or stop this fossil fuel uh, production. And uh, we have specifically investigated this field in the Netherlands, Poland, um, and the UK, and have focused on divestment, um, anti-gas and anti-fracking, and in uh, the UK and Poland also coal. And if you look at this field, um, who are then those actors driving, enabling, or impeding the social innovation? But what's the actor constellation at work? So driving the social innovation in energy are individuals and residents, informal and formal groups, uh, but also NGOs, foundations, associations that work locally, regionally, and nationally, but also internationally on this social innovation in energy. And they're motivated by being connected to a certain place where extraction or exploration of fossil fuels take place. So Think of, for example, um, being in the Netherlands of Groningen um, and the Groningen gas extraction, which, uh, which we have been looking at, or the different uh, fracking sites. But they're also motivated by, um, they can also be motivated by broader environmental and climate change agendas. Uh, so it really depends on, on which actor we're looking at and what their motivation is. And they have these activities which then aim to, to stop this fossil fuels being extracted, being explored, uh, but also being invested in. And that what they then do is, is campaigning, lobbying, striking, or so really mobilizing people, uh, but also taking part in deliberative participatory meetings, thinking about more creative interventions, but also going to court, uh, um, which is happening much more frequently and more successfully. Um, and the activities of these social innovation actors are then, so those that actually drive the social innovation are often targeted at, um, at different kinds of actors, specifically fossil fuel companies, um, but also national governments um, uh, to the extent that they are working together and or supporting and through regulation and collaborations, the fossil fuel industry and institutional investors in, so the, those that are investing in fossil fuel industry, such as banks, pension funds, but also um, uh, universities often. And these local governments um, have played a more, or they have played different roles across the different sites that we have been looking at and across also the different countries. So for example, in the Netherlands, there was, uh, they were supporting the, the, the shale gas free movement by declaring themselves shale gas free, for example, while in Poland, they supported continued coal extraction for job security. So they have a more ambiguous role. And, and what these actors can do, so you, if you look at this, the, the social innovation field and its relation with the energy system, it, they can build on a history of really of environmental movements um, that kind of was revived in all three countries after the Paris Agreement in 2015, and also includes the emergence of a broader, more decentralized, decentrally organized climate movement. And if we consider then this energy system as these regulated markets, then this social innovation clearly aims to challenge three um, relations. The one is between societal actors and market actors. There is a move towards a greater voice of community and non-profits in terms of which kind of energy is being extracted and where. Then a second relation is the one between um, societal actors and government. 
And there it's really about pushing governments to also take into account community and non-profit interests in energy regulation and policy. And this role of the local, national governments actually has become, if you look at it over time and more dynamically, become much more ambivalent over the years, especially in, in the Netherlands, where traditionally they aim to secure energy supply and to this end have kind of formulated policies that maintain the extraction. During the last years, they also started signing international um, uh, climate agreements and targets and thereby make themselves also kind of, um, yeah, they are, don't, are not uh, uh, having coherent policies uh, and strategies and make themselves more vulnerable also to the court rulings that have been taken place because the social innovation actors have then taken the court, uh, the, the, the fossil fuel industries to court, which then means that through the state, me state mechanisms, they again put the pressure on the fossil fuel industries and the, the market um, logic. And the third one is that uh, they look; they have been pressuring the relations between market actors um, investing in such fossil fuel industries and those needing the investing. So really, look, the, the, the relation between these different kinds of market actors by this whole divestment argument that they have been coming forth. So the investors also really a changing role. Um, oops, a second, I think. Do I still have time? I, I think I have still time. So this second part uh, example is a participatory experimentation and incubation. Here it's about experimenting with and learning from novel energy solutions. So including technologies, funding mechanisms, governance structures. So energy solutions really as a broad, um, a broad uh, concept. And they do so through multi-actor collaborative formats, working together in living labs, for example, um, and experimental settings. And here, the most relevant actors are, again, governments at, at its different levels, research institutes and energy businesses. Um, and the more enabling actors really did, did also these governments that provide the, the funding, but also the framework conditions for such uh, participatory experimentation and incubation. And they often focus on more the kind of techno-economic innovation, that's kind of, if you look at it historically, through what's called kind of the triple helix collaborations, including universities, companies, and governments. And over the last decade, um, there has been a movement towards opening this up towards new forms of actor collaboration that then includes more local governments, citizens, and civil society. And they also have a broader societal change agenda, uh, focusing much more on sustainability or social cohesion, related also to energy topics very specifically. And these are then these living labs, uh, city labs, uh, real labore, because it was also studied in Germany. Um, and there's much informal, uh, informal learning taking place between such labs. So it's always about multi-actor collaborations and how they uh, participate, uh, how they uh, incubate and experiment with new energy solutions. Um, there is quite some support through networks. That's less so in the Netherlands, but specifically in Germany, where we've also been looking at it, um, for both of these of these uh, uh, kind of the directions that, that these um, uh, types, so the triple helix and the more uh, social labs are taking. Okay. And what that then means in terms of transforming roles and relations. Um, The, the kind of the dominant triple helix, of course, resembles the dominance of the market along the state logic, as we have already kind of discussed. Uh, and there are certain trends that then led to um, these new actors and these new collaborative formats coming up. And these are then, the, you know, the citizens, which is within the state logic that go for, uh, that uh, participate in um, participatory experimentation and incubation, the local governments that start funding them, so they take on new roles. The associations that all of a, or they're not all of a sudden, but that come part of, of regulatory uh, experiments, uh, especially for, for the grid uh, management, but also the user side. And they become so many more actors become involved, and, um, and there is then pressure on um, basically on the orientation that this kind of um, experimentation has been taking to date, which was much more. Uh, sort of kind of techno-economics or technological solutions uh, that can then be put successfully on the market towards uh, more socially and emancipatory-focused emancipatory 
collaborative learning for sustainable um, development. So what they do challenge is the kind of dominance of the large share companies uh, and the national government in defining the directions um, of participatory exploitation in the energy sector. Okay, to sum up. Um, so what these, what these two examples sh show, and we are still in, 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 the, in, the, in the process of looking at all these 18 examples and drawing out you know, the main mechanisms uh, that's still ongoing, but what we see is that Non-profit actors and local governments are really taking up very much new roles in energy systems. And you also see that very much back in literature. Um, and that the perceived dominance of the for-profit logic specifically is being challenged and altered. Um, but it still stays strong. And that's something we, we would like to investigate further. Um, so the, the, uh, Thomas and Gerdine have asked me to also reflect on the, on the statement, basically, of the, uh, or, yeah, of the conference. And I've put it into a question. Should social innovation be considered as the next step in pushing sustainable energy transitions forward? And I thought this is a nice reflection to close the talk with. Because considering the attempts towards building these more decentralized and decarbonized energy systems, we have qu come quite a long way. Um, and I want to take the X curve, um, which depicts transition dynamics, both of kind of building up the new, but also of breaking down the old, uh, and changes towards more localized and decentralized and decarbonized and also digitalized energy systems are kind of in full swing. And they have been argued to be beyond the acceleration, much more towards the institutionalization phase. Um, so the kind of what you could argue that we're in this little wide circle where the kind of magic happens, the transition space, where uh, the old doesn't really fully work anymore, but the new is, is not also built up. And that's also, we see that through um, the, the kind of phasing out, it's also really taking up. up. But what that dynamic in, in the energy system uh, does is that it really puts this focus on institutional change. Um, and since institutions, they comprise rules, they comprise narratives, um, practices, they are but Kind of the ways we engage in, think about and organize energy systems, and they include these roles and relations uh, of different actors therein. So that's why I think uh, the, the kind of statement holds in that this is the focus that we currently have, it's where the, the changes will, <clears throat> will or not take place. So it seems fitting description for the current dynamics. And in order to navigate these transition dynamics, um, it seems wise to really take on the full potential of social innovation um, and of existing social innovation research um, when using this concept in energy system transformation. And I just want to highlight a number of things that I think are specifically important. It can be used as an analytical category, and that's what we try to do, but also as a kind of normative change, really already including also the, the kind of direction you would like to go to. Um, it can be about improvement, you know, the little things, uh, but it can also be much more about emancipation and transformation. So what are the, these big changes and make this, this, uh, this open for discussion? Specifically, it shows these different directionalities that there are, so the different um, um, directions that we consider desirable or undesirable, so that are coming to the fore when we look at different types of social innovation. Specifically, for example, if you look at the different types of social interactions that each of these promote. What is it that we as a society want to rule the, 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 our energy systems? What are these directions that we want to take? And that it shows just much more the diversity there. It's not about the absence of the technology, but it helps us to foreground these social elements and not let them be taken back because then it's just not easily engineered. There's not a blueprint for doing this. This is just, it asks time and it asks some discomfort from every actor in society to kind of shift in what they're doing and how they're relating to others. So it really foregrounds the social without wanting to downplay the role of materiality and technology. Um, yeah, so putting this focus on the social institutional aspect and it shows both the institutionalization but also what needs to be the uh, institutionalized. So yes, um, this is where I want to stop. Um, thank you very much. For the opportunity to share my research. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this uh, interesting presentation and your your reflection on the next steps. Um, I think we get a lot of inspiration also from all the people here in the conference about those next steps. So uh, thank you. And we also got some of the questions I see here. 
And I also um, checking if Thomas, can you also come in? I know that Thomas is working from home. So maybe uh, Andy has a little baby. So maybe uh, he, he had to baby, uh, take care of the baby. So I will take over. Um, let me see the Q&A. Uh, I have to see where I can start. I will start with the first one that is visible. The MAP framework is a great tool, but the, the, the person that asked this question wants to know, how can we categorize those actors that are more blended, like climate action projects or social enterprises and landscape approach consortiums? Can yeah. you reply to that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great tool in that it's kind of neat and ordered and it helps us, you know, see categories and order reality. But of course, it's a, it's a construct and you need to be seeing for what, why would you want to pigeonhole? Um, what I think it does really nicely is that if you look at these more blended or hybrid actors, is that it shows that why they're having so much difficulty in getting established. It is because they are combining different logics. So if you think about social enterprises, they are combining the more market logic, so they go for they're for profit, but they're also for social good. So they they combine the more market logic with the more non profit logic at the same time, and so they are they're kind of at this at this border that they're by kind of permeating and kind of trying to get rid of, and um, and that means that they are not at home within market regulations. That's they're not going to be taken up there. It's not their institutional home, but neither. Uh, within the non-profit sector because they're like look at yeah but you're making profit so that's also sh it sh I think it helps to see why some of these more blended or hybrid uh, organizations are having difficulties to position themselves because they're not fitting within the uh, normal or usual logics that we consider that we are um, trained into thinking uh, with yeah. great thank you very much for that answer uh, if the person that poses this answer uh, likes to to have a clarification. They can put it in the in the Q and A again. Um, I see another uh, Q, a Q question coming up here. Is there a missing element in your model, the household as distinct from community, when you use a threefold structure of community, market, state? Are you conflating households and community? Yes, <laughs> consider households as part of community for community being um, the informal and households as being an informal category. Um, and so looking at these different also degrees of um, or, or scales, if you like, so you have the individuals, you know, it can be a father, mother, I would put them also in the more informal sphere. Uh, but then also the household as, as a more organizational category and then the community. Yes, I would consider these to be uh, the more informal uh, spheres. Yeah, and I think that's also um, a difficulty in the type of work we do, I would say, because this is also an always, I think, a, a, a discussion also with the PhD students if they have to decide on the, like the scale of the case do you look at, at uh, neighborhoods, communities, yeah. households? And I think in every um, city and every country, maybe that, that might be something different. Even if you look at the region, yeah. for instance, we with the energy uh, um, transition, we have these re regional energies, uh, yeah, the rest, it like yeah, yeah. we made in the Netherlands. But if, uh, if you compare that with other countries, then they might not have these like boundaries. So yeah. how, how do you deal with that? Is it case by case or do you have a magic formula? <laughs> no, I usually go, <laughs> no magic formula, unfortunately. I usually go by, um, yeah, it depends on my research question, but I usually go with what actors consider to be a, a, a meaningful uh, category. Um, yeah. yeah, and that can be region. Um, and then I always take one as an entry point, but try not to forget about the other. So if you take the, the regions as an entry point, or is, especially if you look at cities, cities in energy transitions, you cannot think of cities and their role in energy transitions without thinking about the national and international regulatory environment within the act, right? Yeah. So it's also about like taking it as an entry point, but also seeing what's kind of above and below it. You know, yeah. How they embed yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's also the most useful because yes. for that actors in that particular situation, that is a useful unit to uh, to study, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, I continue the, because we have uh, uh, many questions coming in and I'm, I'm trusting on the moderators to uh, um, help me out a little bit here to make things invisible as you unanswered answered. Uh, in terms of hands-on organizations, what are the characteristics that make the difference between SIE, I think that means social uh, innovation uh, and energy and SIE initiatives? Yeah, so for me, the difference is one thing is an actor. The SA initiative is for me an, an, an actor. Um, and the other thing is really these configurations of ideas, actions, and objects that can, that can potentially change social relations. So, um, so the one, yeah, one is the actor, and the other is the thing that the actor does in order to change the energy system. Um, okay, and thank you very much. I see here, and um, I have to see, it's a, a question that exists from three parts, but I have to scroll down to the first part, and my screen is very, very small, uh, so I'm not sure if I can start there. So I, <laughs> even if I scroll, I have to zoom in. Yes, this helps. Okay, and I don't wear my glasses, so I'm very close to the camera now. Sorry, everybody. Um, what about the role that tech innovations play in the emergence possibility of social innovations? It seems that tech innovations are somehow, somehow unaccounted for. For instance, here's part two, Let's scroll up. Innovative socio-communal organizations around energy generation are themselves made possible precisely due to the novel characteristics of the rustig. Part three. Its decentralized nature, enhanced modularity, low financial entry barriers, etc. How many nuclear power cops exist? I think that is the final part of the question. Okay. Can you can you answer this? Uh, yeah, I try. Um, yeah, I hope there's no nuclear cops out there. Um, let me see. I I hope they're not unaccounted for. But the whole idea. Um, behind talking about social innovation rather than, for example, social technical innovation or social material innovation is that I really want to foreground the social because the, the technology has been given rather quite some credit, quite some money, uh, quite a focus because it's a much easier kind of um, uh, Phenomena that can be managed, you know, you can make a project and then you, you know, invest, 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 and then there will be this technology as, at a certain point with some uh, ingenious engineers working on it. Um, but I want to foreground that, that we also need to take care of the social, basically. That's why I focus on social innovation. And I hope to have given enough credit in my talk to the technology because for me, the social, is, the social innovation is this combination of ideas, actions, and objects, and indeed, Without the, the the wind turbines that you can put on your roof, or you know the solar PV on your roof, that, you know there's no uh, there's no household consumer and not this kind of social innovation. So yes, it, it plays an important part, but I choose through this perspective on social innovation to foreground also the other aspects that are needed in order to make this work. Because we also there's this this whole argument, right? The technology is there, but it's just not happening. Yeah. As if the technology is 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 is. Uh, it doesn't have to play for it not being taken up, but society you knows it's like dumb enough to not take it up if you put it like this. So, I, and then it's just to say, okay, this is not only about the technology, this is about how it, how it plays together and how it's being made useful or not. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that you gave enough credit uh, in your presentation <laughs> to that, and, and, and I think that's also something that um, many of us struggle as at least also here in Delft, of course because we work so closely also with the, the people yeah. that are working on the technology. Yeah. And I think that, that over the years, um, uh, it started to resonate more and more that we really uh, are synergetic, that, that yes. uh, our research um, also, uh, the, so the, the social scientific research needs also the input yeah. from the, from the te technology people and yeah. the other way around. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I also experienced that in the last 10 years, that it's much more kind of growing together. And also that there's this attempt and the, the, the kind of, everybody takes the time because it, it takes time to talk to one another because you have so yeah. different concepts, so different ideas about how the world functions. That, yeah. To learn yeah, 
in, in one of the sessions yesterday that also came up and in the discussion that we need to uh, learn to speak the same language in order to understand uh, each other and to uh, to come to this synergy because yeah. we we come from different backgrounds also academic backgrounds yeah. and also different traditions in doing research maybe even uh, different perspective perspectives on that yeah. um, I, I think that's one of the most interesting things that we that we do with this kind of research and I see also in the audience uh, uh, people that are also from this very uh, um, heterogenic um, background scientific background so uh, if you have um, energy enough can we do another question yeah, sure yes okay um, really interesting presentation thank you this one has two likes uh, this question according to your research in what way do the counter fossil fuel use si reproduce dominant institutions um, what are the dark sides paradoxes that occur in their relation to dominant institutions slash logics? Yeah. They're not questioning, for example. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about that also quite a lot with the colleagues. But what they are doing is they're, for example, not questioning the whole market based logics. They're not questioning how, um, who should own energy sources. So that part, that's not, oh, what, that's not part of this of their innovation as, fra as, as having these frames against. Um, it's not that I want to discredit there's actors that have a balanced story, right? They have these frames against, but they're also advocate for. And usually these narratives that they have are both, they're kind of showing the problem and then also so certainly solutions. Um, but there are actors that are kind of uh, really against. There has been this... Um, this organization in the Netherlands, and I was always I like them. It's Vachadir. It's like a wake, I don't know, a wake up uh, animal. But basically, they were really <laughs> against uh, how animals were being treated, and they were just only having like blaming arguments on 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 the radio spots, for example. Um, and I thought they were quite successful in in focusing on this message because they were then complemented by. Uh, the friends of the earth and all the others that would then sit around the table with these companies that would do the wrong and could, you know, have this deliberation with them. But they are really their role as, as this organization was really focusing on just focusing on these frames against. Um, and I think within the, uh, the movements towards uh, or against fossil fuels, it's much more nuanced, but there's also quite some that go say, OK, this is really not working. Uh, but the most successful ones, like for example, uh, the, uh, of successful ones, the Groningen Gasbeweging, we have been looking at, so one of the local groups in, in Groningen, they have been really combining strategies. So they have been doing this against, you know, throwing potatoes, uh, as well as just sitting on the table. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Wakardier is uh, also, I think, good in being really independent in that yeah. case. Um, yeah. The, I, I, I was also thinking about the translation. It's it's, it's yeah. an animal that's not sleeping, but yeah. It's, yeah. 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 it's not really woke, I would say. But no. uh, <laughs> okay, um, uh, maybe the final question, and then um, I will I will thank you uh, properly for your presentation. Uh, the MAP perspective is very useful on domains and roles, but what would be a good way to make the power uh, between brackets positions clearer or clarified? Um, my colleague is working on that, so I, uh, I okay. <laughs> actually, I think I still share the screen. So do you see this unlocking the transformative power of social innovation in energy on the right uh, corner? It's a guide that was just released and that's really going into um, enhancing the, the transformative power of social innovations in energy and how to do that more practically as well. So I really warmly recommend that. And it's it's also in, uh, including a number of um, on the website. It's including a number of videos on on how she thinks about uh, as a floor. You know, I'm referring okay. to things about uh, power in, in social innovation. So uh, I, I I would just refer that. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Great. If you have a um, a publication or something that you would like to share, because we want to also share the questions later on our website, yeah. and maybe we can share the publication yeah. there. Yeah. So uh, th that leaves me to properly uh, thank you. Um, we have a special uh, gift to our keynote speakers and chairs, and that is a tree. People who were there yesterday um, already know that we uh, have, uh, uh, well, we, we are buying a tree because we, we ordered a tree, but it's not planted yet. So for, for this conference, we, we, we have bought an oak 
um, um, this oak will be taken care of for at least 25 years and it will be planted in the forest of the future in o Odorn, which is in Drenthe in the northeast of, um, uh, of the Netherlands. And this forest of the future will be visible from Google Earth uh, because it's in the, it will be planted in the form of a, of a flower. So one of these trees uh, is the is for, is the, the 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 social innovation and energy transition 2021 tree. We have a plaquette there, a plaque, uh, and that's our way to thank all of the people that contribute to to our um, conference. We think it's a sustainable gift that will be there forever. You can visit this, visit it. You can uh, look at it for the next 25 years. Uh, I think I will be retired by then, uh, but but hopefully the, the oak is then very very large. Um, so you find more information also on the website about this memory tree if you if you would like to know. But this is our way to thank you very much, and um, yeah, I hope to see you in the future more often, of course. Thank you, Julia. Also uh, um, on behalf of Thomas. Okay, then we will stop broadcasting uh, this opening session for everybody. It's coffee break now, and we like to see you back in. Uh, other sessions.